My guest today is Brian Chow, an attorney with the law firm Barth Calderon LLP. Brian has an MBA and a JD from Pepperdine University and is a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. His practice is devoted to asset protection, estate planning, and business succession. Brian, thank you for coming on my show. Not a problem. So, Brian, let's start with what is asset protection? Sure. So asset protection is really about um, structuring your assets to make it more difficult for creditors to sue you and to take your assets away from you. So what you're really doing is basically putting firewalls between your assets and liabilities. For most people, they don't have really any planning at all. So their assets and their liabilities are basically on a flat plane, like on a tape, right? So if something happens with to them, either they get into a car accident or maybe they have a tenant slip and fall on one of their properties, that liability flows pretty easily um, onto all of their assets. And so asset protection planning is really about putting in structures in place to make it that much more difficult for a creditor to uh, to either bring a lawsuit, to get a judgment against you, and ultimately to collect on that judgment. So the more difficult and the more uncertain it is for a creditor, the more likely it is that you'll either be able to get a creditor to go away, um, or if they're really going to come after you, it forces them to the bargaining table so that you can negotiate a settlement for a lot less money, a lot less time, and a lot less headache uh, than you otherwise would have. Is it better to begin asset protection planning before facing the problem, or can you start planning when you know a lawsuit is coming? All things being equal, it's better to start before something, uh, some liability has reared its ugly head. It's kind of like buying insurance. You know, a bad time to buy insurance, uh, let's say homeowner's insurance, is when your roof is on fire. Um, uh, the asset protection planning that we do for our clients uh, works uh, really works best before something bad has gone wrong. But that being said, that doesn't mean that we don't have clients that come to us after the fact and they say, hey, you know, I got into a car accident and I'm in the middle of this lawsuit or, you know, I have some, some uh, employment issues going on with my business and, you know, how do I manage that liability? Even though um, there may be an impending lawsuit or that liability has already occurred, there may be still things that we can do to make it more uh, to make it more difficult for creditors to get at those assets. But even though the efficacy of uh, of some of that planning may be limited for that particular creditor, it does motivate the clients to get their ducks in order so that for future creditors, there's going to be a much higher degree of protection. So a lot of times when clients are nervous or anxious about uh, a current liability, uh, it provides the motivation for them to get everything in place so that they'll be much better off again, if they encounter any liabilities in the future. And the other side of your work is estate planning. And do the two overlap, the asset protection planning and the estate planning, and, and how do they overlap? Uh, great question, Aaron. So yes, they do overlap. Um, and, and actually, truth be told, estate planning is almost a subset of asset protection planning in the sense that um, we're planning for what happens in the event of death or incapacity. So we're talking about uh, transitioning assets or transitioning authority to the people that we trust to help manage things and to carry out our wishes. So, so asset protection is not only about, hey, while I'm alive, how do I set things up so that I make sure that I keep you know, all of those assets that I'm accumulating, but then also talking about now that I've accumulated all these assets, how do I effectively transition those assets to the next generation, to charity and furtherance of my uh, legacy or to future generations beyond that? And so uh, estate planning to a large degree is about how you structure these things uh, so that we uh, protect these assets from taxes. When we're passing them on to the, to the next generation, there's something out there called the estate tax which is a tax that the government places on your assets when you pass away. So we want to plan for that. 
We also make, want to make sure that when we pass these assets on to our loved ones, um, that they're also preserved for our loved ones for future generations as well. So there's lots of things that we can do from that perspective to protect those assets from not only our own creditors, but also our loved ones' creditors, uh, should they get, it, uh, get a divorce, should they um, encounter professional liability or business liability uh, down the road, um, or also protecting them from themselves if they're um, maybe irresponsible or, or lack the financial acumen to manage those assets themselves. So, um, so a lot of that really, um, so a lot of estate planning really uh, dovetails into asset protection and carries a lot of asset protection uh, components to it. Another aspect of estate planning is avoiding going to court. When people pass away, if they don't plan properly, oftentimes their assets end up in court and it's very expensive uh, to administrate those assets through what's called a probate proceeding. So planning properly also allows us to administer all these assets outside of the probate process, which means everything can be privately administered so that we don't incur a lot of the costs and the headache of uh, a formal court proceeding after somebody passes away as well. So estate planning and asset protection are very closely linked. And, uh, and we utilize a lot of uh, similar structures in both estate planning and asset protection to accomplish similar goals. Okay, let's talk about uh, asset protection uh, and some of the structures for asset protection before a problem arises. So before you, you if you're uh, in the hypothetical situation of a business owner, before you breach a contract or are accused of be breaching a contract, which, what steps should you take to protect uh, your business assets and your personal assets? And, uh, and then after that, we can talk about estate planning to pass on those assets to your children, your grandchildren, uh, your heirs, and so on. Uh, step one is uh, you should consider uh, forming an entity for your business. Uh, a lot of small businesses start out as what, what's called a sole proprietorship, um, which is basically a, a person uh, conducting business as an individual. Um, and one of the drawbacks of a sole proprietorship is that any liabilities of the business can uh, freely attach to any of the business owner's personal assets. So. In a situation that you had described where you have this business owner and he gets accused of breaching a contract, then that liability um, can freely attach to his house, his bank accounts, uh, his investments, his rental properties, etc. So for people who have accumulated any, any amount of uh, assets, it's almost always better uh, if that person is operating an active business to select some sort of entity to shelter his personal assets from the liabilities of the business. Um, now, what kind of entity that business should be will depend on a, ho a host of factors, um, not only asset protection, but also uh, taxes um, and also licensing restrictions. So it really uh, depends on a host of things, but some common entities that a business owner might use would be a corporation or an LLC. Um, and those are uh, entities that will not only provide some structure as to the management of the business itself, but also uh, provides to shelter that person's personal assets from their business liability. So now we've talked about a business owner. What about a comparable situation where you're just an individual and you're not operating a business, you're not anyone's boss? but you maybe have a high income or, uh, or even a low income? Is there a difference in asset protection structures and strategies? Uh, yes, <laughs> there, there are. Um, and so, so obviously um, asset protection does require um, that you have assets. Um, so if you don't have any assets, uh, there's really not much for you to be concerned about from an asset protection standpoint, because it's very difficult and, and, and in many cases impossible to squeeze blood from a stone, right? So if I have a bank account with $5,000 in it, 
and I'm renting and I um, really don't have a whole lot else, um, if I get into a car accident, well, there's really not a whole lot for a creditor to go after. Um, but if we contrast that, if I have multiple investment properties, um, I've got a $2 million home, um, and I've got a successful business, and uh, a bunch of money in the bank and investments, well, that's going to be much more critical. I'm going to want to really make sure that um, I plan properly for those assets because uh, I have more to lose. And also, the more you have, you can think of uh, assets kind of like gravity, right? So the more assets or the more mass you accumulate, financial mass, um, the more liability is going to be attracted to you. So um, the more assets you uh, have and the more assets you accumulate, the more critical it is um, that you engage in this sort of planning uh, because the, the likelihood of somebody trying to take those assets away from you uh, increases the more, uh, the more assets you have. So it, let's say you have assets and you have a nice big gravity of liability. So you have a target painted on your back and everyone wants to sue you. Uh, the government wants to tax you and, uh, and there are all kinds of problems you're facing. But, but you're not a business owner, but you own assets. Um, you know, maybe you uh, have a high paying job or you sold your business. Uh, and you're retired. What, yep. what what options do you have to pr protect yourself? The options that you have to protect yourself will depend on the assets that you have. So, um, and the the liability that you will more likely be concerned about is personal liability. Um, so, as a business owner, right? There's the liability of operating the business itself. And um, whether that be dealing with employees, whether that be dealing with vendors, whether that dealing be that dealing with the, the ins and outs of the operations of an active uh, concern on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as a retiree, there may not be that concern, right? There may not be that liability of operating uh, an active business, but there may be other liabilities that uh, accrue to uh, this retiree based on the assets he has. For instance, if he has, uh, in many cases, retirees, um, they have rental properties or other uh, investments, pat more passive investments that come with their own sets of liabilities. You have tenants, you have tenants, guests and invitees, you have neighbors, um, you have people who are perhaps working on the property, you have maybe environmental concerns, uh, etc. Um, so that, that's one type of liability. There's also the liability associated with the person themselves. So if that retiree goes out and he gets into a car accident, somebody sues him, right? Now that liability can attach to all of his assets as well. So, um, so liability can flow in a, in a number of ways. And uh, understanding where they flow and what assets they flow from or where the source of the liability is coming from or coming through that really becomes key in kind of understanding how to set up an asset protection plan. But I think what you're asking, Aaron, is perhaps for some specific examples of how uh, someone in that, that retiree situation um, might plan for uh, asset protection. And would you like me to kind of maybe sh uh, detail a couple of ways that, uh, that that person might engage in asset protection? Well, in some, in some broad strokes, because I, I assume that each case is at least slightly different and in some cases they're probably broadly different in terms of the strategies and the approaches that you take and that's why yeah. someone would come to you is to guide them through that so so let's go back to the retiree right so the retiree he's uh he's earned a bunch of, uh he's he's accumulated a bunch of uh of money and a bunch of assets and, and let's say that he's got a you know million dollar home it's almost paid off um, and he owns it with his wife. Now, this is a pretty common scenario. Clients, clients they get married, um, and then they accumulate assets during the course of their marriage. Um, usually, they don't have a prenup or a postnuptial agreement, so everything's if they're California residents, everything is accumulated as community property, which means essentially that husband and wife were two separate people before they got married, but essentially when they got married, they became one person. So now that person, as they accumulate assets, everything is owned 100% by that, essentially that joint person. 
So a lot of times people assume that when they acquire things as community property that they own uh, everything 50-50. That's actually not true. That actually only applies in the event of a divorce or a separation. Um, while they're together, they actually own everything, again, 100-100. So what that means is the liability of one spouse will, can attach to 100% of their community assets and same thing with the liability of the other spouse. So um, in that situation, again, where you have significant assets, uh, oftentimes it makes sense to divide the community property such that each spouse doesn't own 100% of everything they or an overlapping 100% of everything, but instead they each own an undivided 50% interest in their assets. So in this case, husband and wife engage in a postnuptial agreement where they basically decide that they're no longer going to operate uh, under uh, community property law, uh, laws. So this isn't uh, a document that's made in anticipation of divorce. We're not saying, hey, we're splitting everything up or you're giving me more than I have or vice versa. They're basically just saying, hey, if we owned everything as community property, we no longer want to do that. We want to opt out of community property. So instead of be treating their assets as if they owned uh, all those things as California residents, they're choosing to treat it as if they were residents of a non-community property state, of which there are 39, I believe, or 38. Um, so instead of treating their assets like they lived in California, they might treat their assets like they lived in a common law state, like, for instance, uh, Massachusetts or New York. And so now what happens is husband owns 50% and wife owns 50%. So what happens is now... If either one of them incurs liability, let's say wife, again, she gets into an auto accident, she sideswipes someone, that person is now paraplegic, they get a $10 million judgment against them, they can't just come in and take the house. Because previously, right, if everything was owned as community property, then it's ex the 100% of the asset is exposed. So a creditor can come in and take those assets, and the only thing that the, um, that this, um, the married couple would get would be the value of the homestead exemption, which is... In California, for a married couple, it's $100,000. Um, so uh, rather than being able to take the home, now what happens is the creditors, the best they can do is get a lien for a 50% interest in the property, and husband and wife can continue to live in the property, and they don't have to do anything unless they decide to sell the property. So what all that does is it gives them more of that leverage to, get, to negotiate a more favorable settlement. So that's one example of a relatively simple thing that can be done uh, from an asset protection standpoint as it pertains to uh, the house. Something that we commonly hear from clients and prospects is, um, you know, what is the role of insurance in all of this? You know, I have insurance. Does that mean that I should also have some asset protection planning as well? Um, and, and the answer is it depends on, on your situation, but... Uh, generally speaking, if you have assets, asset protection planning makes a lot of sense because uh, insurance is great and insurance is a, an, an integral part of any good asset protection plan, uh, but there are a lot of shortcomings of insurance um, and oftentimes clients get lulled into a false sense of security if they think they have a $2 million umbrella policy, they think they're covered, but really understanding how it all works in the grand scheme of things is really important. So case in point... Um, Insurance um, has shortcomings for a number of reasons. So one being that um, insurance policies come with a lot of exclusions. So insurance doesn't cover everything, otherwise it would be prohibitively expensive. The way that it works is if you're lo looking at your policies, you'll say pages one and two deal with what's covered, pages three through 15 deal with what's excluded. Um, a lot of times these exclusions are really born from lawsuits. So Somebody gets an insurance policy. Let's say I get a homeowner's insurance policy from Allstate. My house catches on fire for some reason, and I go to Allstate and say, hey, I, I, I would like to file a claim because I have this, have this fire at my house. Allstate decides for whatever reason that they don't want to pay that claim. So then I go and I hire an attorney. I sue Allstate, and a judge ultimately rules in my favor and says, Allstate, you got to pay Brian a million dollars uh, on this policy. All states says, okay, we'll do that for this particular uh, incident, but we don't want to do it for future uh, incidents. So we're just going to write them out of future policies. So what happens is a lot of these exclusions that accumulate in these policies, and they typically are high liability, uh, low probability events. But if you think about insurance, 
what do you really want your insurance to do? You want it to keep you want to keep from going to the poorhouse if something unexpected happens. If you have a situation where you have robust insurance, but for whatever reason it's not covered, that's a problem. Another problem is is even let's say it's arguable that it should be covered. If the insurance company doesn't doesn't want to play ball, then now you have to sue them while you're being sued uh, to convince them or compel them to, to cover you, which is not a fun option either. Uh, another uh, limitation of insurance are the policy limits. Um, if you have a $2 million umbrella policy, but a five or $10 million loss, and then um, you know, you've, got a, you've, got, you've still got a problem. Um, so those are all things to consider. Uh, when you're talking about asset protection planning. So asset protection, really what it does is it works in conjunction with your insurance. So what we do is we create these firewalls and barriers to wrap up the assets that we have so that it becomes more difficult to go after those assets. Because what is the creditor going to do? The creditor typically wants their money and they want it right away. And so um, they will usually take the path of least resistance to do that. And so that's where the insurance really comes in. It's because if you wrap up the, your, your, the, the assets in your estate, that makes it much more difficult to go after. The insurance is kind of like the low-hanging fruit that a creditor can go after. So we drive the, the, um, the creditor towards the insurance so that they leave your other assets alone. Another important thing about the insurance is it provides the liquidity for you to make, some, make things right if you genuinely did harm somebody else. Um, a lot of times people assume, well, hey, if I wrap everything up and build these walls and structures so that I'm uh, very difficult to come after, if I harm somebody, well, I'm just going to sit you know, behind these walls and laugh. But the truth of the matter is if we really hurt somebody, uh, oftentimes we, we would like to help them. We just prefer to do it on our terms rather than somebody else dictating those terms to us. But what that insurance does, again, is it provides that liquidity so that we can make things right uh, if something, if we really do hurt somebody else. We've talked about business formation, uh, post-nuptials, insurance, and uh, sort of the concept of building structures and a firewall around your assets to protect yep. them. Yep. Once you've protected your assets, uh, I guess the goal would be to pass them on. And that's the other side of the coin the state planning, where does that begin? Or does that begin with asset protection? And then in that case, what's the next step to estate planning? Sure. So, so the first step is really um, to get a sense of a client's personal, uh, family, uh, fi and financial situations. And then from there, really get a sense of what their goals are. Because... Um, some clients, they may have accumulated significant assets, but maybe their primary concern uh, is just getting an estate plan in place so that if something unexpected happens to them, they can rest easy knowing that it will all go for the benefit of their children or to charity in the way that they kind of, um, in, the, in the way that they specify. Um, so a lot of it is client driven. Other clients, again, they may, they may um, have incurred a loss and may be very anxious about a potential lawsuit. And so in, in those situations, they're probably going to prioritize getting the asset protection planning in place first. So uh, what we typically do is we'll start with an analysis and, and really kind of delve into the client situation and talk with them about kind of what's keeping them up at night or what are they, uh, what are they really fixated on or want to focus on. From an estate planning standpoint, um, once we get a sense of the client's situation, then we can really kind of dive into putting together a plan. And oftentimes when we're putting together an estate plan, usually we're leading with a revocable living trust. Um, and that particular document uh, or that particular planning tool is essentially an entity uh, whereby uh, you can place ownership of your assets so that you can easily manage them during the course of your lifetime, but in the event of your death or incapacity, um, the ownership of the asset is really held by the entity, by the trust. Because if I, as an individual, Brian, let's say I buy a house and my name is on the deed, um, that means I'm the legal owner and I can do with it what I want. 
Um, if I wanted to sell the property to you, Aaron, I could sign a deed and transfer it over to you. If I wanted to go to the bank and take out a loan, I could go do that, right? Because I'm the legal owner. But if I die or if I become incapacitated, I no longer have any actual authority to make any decisions with regards to those assets. Um, everything, um, but everything is still held in my name. So according to the documents, I'm the only person with any legal authority to make decisions. And so since nobody else in the world is me, no one else has the authority to step in and do anything on that property. So it just sits there. It's not being productive. It's not being rented. It's not being lived in. And so at that point, it falls to the state to figure out what to do with my stuff. So the probate court is the arm of the state that comes in and they gather up all my assets and try to figure out what it is uh, that I had, what debts did I owe, make sure my creditors are paid off. And then ultimately a judge is going to try to determine what it is I actually wanted. So he's going to look at things like, did I have a will, did I have a trust, did I have a spouse, did I have children? Were there any other circumstances or documents which would give some sort of indication as to what it is I actually wanted? Eventually, the judge is going to say, okay, this is what I believe Brian wanted. I hereby declare everything gets distributed in this manner. Slams the gavel, then my loved ones can take ownership and do what they need to do. But in order to get from point A to point B, we got to go through this long, drawn-out court process, which is very expensive, very time-consuming, and public. So those are three big reasons that people generally want to avoid probate. So what happens is when we place these assets into this uh, entity, this trust, what happens is is the trust owns everything. I'm the trustee or I'm the manager of the trust, so I can move assets around or buy things or sell things during the course of my lifetime. It's very easy. Um, but in the event of my passing, nothing's owned in my name. So I'm the one who died. If I don't own anything, there's nothing to probate. If everything's held in the name of the trust and the trust continues to exist after I'm no longer around, well then, um, then uh, again, there's nothing to probate. So. I'm the president of the company during the course of my lifetime, but I also appoint vice presidents. So let's say, Aaron, if I appoint you as my vice president, if I'm no longer around, you now step up uh, as the acting president of the trust, and you now have the authority to carry out the terms. So if I say my trust goes to my son, you can now sign all the documents to transfer the property from my trust to my son. And by doing that, we're able to, uh, one, I'm able to appoint the people that I want who I actually trust to carry out my wishes rather than leaving it to a judge who probably doesn't know me at all. Number two, we're able to accomplish everything outside of the probate process. So we're able to make things a lot less expensive, a lot less time consuming, and everything is privately administered um, so that the only people that have a legal right to see what's going on are going to be my natural born heirs or anyone else that I choose to appoint rather than it going through the court system where anyone can see what kind of assets I have and where everything is going to go. And once you have an estate plan, you have, let's say, a will and a trust, what are the triggers for updates or should they just update it and, and review it, uh, review their plan every few years or upon specific events? Like obviously if someone gets married, then they're probably going to want to update uh, both their asset protection plan and their estate plan. But let's say, uh, what, what other sort of triggers are there? That's also a really, really good question, um, and it uh, it will depend to some degree on, on the client and what kind of assets they have, um, but I will say as a general proposition, uh, when you experience major life events, that's a great time to come in and kind of review things. So um, marriage, birth of a child, um, a death in the family, um, Kids getting married, right? Getting married or divorced. Uh, um, kids, uh, major changes in net worth. Um, if you receive a windfall or a large inheritance, um, if your business increases significantly in value, if you, um, when tax laws change. So um, a lot of times when tax laws change, that can affect uh, clients' estate plan or asset protection plan. Um, and that's something we certainly strive to keep our clients um, in the loop on. But uh, when you have those sorts of events, that's a great time to come in and kind of revisit things. Um, however, sometimes clients will just go through life and they don't really think things have changed much at all. And in those cases, I would recommend at least, uh, you know, every two to three years, uh, you should uh, revisit things with your attorney uh, to make sure that everything's kind of operating um, smoothly. Um, and 
for those clients that have more assets and more complicated estates, maybe they have multiple businesses, multiple structures and entities, um, it may make sense to get together more often, maybe on an annual basis to make sure that everything's uh, still operating the way that it was intended to and to make tweaks where necessary.